Uh, this is actually the 8th Air Force annual reunion, but there are other groups, uh, organizations with a lot of the bomb groups have made, but also uh, World War II pilots, and then I, I'm Troop uh, 315 Troop Care Group. So with those of us that are not a part of the 8th, uh, meet independently, but as affiliation or a part of the 8th Air Force Reunion. Wow, that's great. What's it like to see maybe some old friends or maybe meet some new people? At 96, you don't meet that many old friends, but you meet a lot of new friends every time you come here. And we've been here now for several years, know every, most people, and they certainly know us because we're, de we're devils when we get turned loose and tease people. Great. Um, um, for me, I know the importance of what you guys did, you know, in World War II and Korea and Nam, Desert Storm, all the way up. I, I took part in Iraqi freedom and, um, and during freedom, my wife took part for 20 years. Um, it's because of you guys, we still speak English. We still have freedom because of what you did. What do you say to maybe a, a younger person that maybe doesn't know that history? Because they really don't teach a lot of this in school. You learn from history but if you ignore history, it's going to come back on you. So you must learn the mistakes that you made in the past, what the government made, what we all made, so that we don't repeat those past mistakes and move forward, not backwards. And I'm afraid at times now we're moving backwards with the violence. They talk about the greatest generation. It's not the, it is not the greatest generation of fellows. It's the greatest of people, particularly in the United States. We appreciated and loved each other, not share, sharing or shedding out hatred and disagreement. We could do things peacefully. Now it's all forcefully. Can you tell me, uh, take me way back in time, beyond 75 years ago, were you drafted? How did you get into World War II? Well, we both volunteered right after the World War II began. We enjoyed the, uh, the late Navy as pilot cadets to fly. And uh, we were both identically, of course, accepted the same time. So it was a big publicity stunt to try to promote more Navy cadets, pilots. Uh, but once we got in and were accepted, a month and a half later, our enlistment was disqualified because of a childhood contact with tuberculosis, and you couldn't have that aboard a ship, even though we didn't have it. So instead, we immediately re-enlisted in the Army Air Corps. They said, yes, after you pass the tests from both the Navy and the Army, you were pretty well qualified to pass tests. So they told us when we were enlisted, uh, just go back to your job. We'll call you when we want you. So about two, a few months later, they called us, and we both came together. And in the process of as our training for as pilot cadets, we got separated. Uh, Whether well, it was deliberate because of the Fletcher or Sullivan brothers or what, we don't know. But uh, we never got together after that. I graduated before Bob because he was um, held back for... Thought he had valley fever, and which he didn't, so they delayed him. So I got and graduated in March of 40, uh, 44, and I went overseas to U Europe, and uh, as a D-day replacement. Wow. And so from that standpoint, well, I stayed with that outfit, the 315th Troop Care Group, all through the war till it was all over with, and then just the day or so before. Before it ended, our whole group of pilots were all sent over to form a military airline from Europe through Africa, Ascension Island, uh, Brazil, and back up to Trinidad, and then on to Miami. But So we were stationed in the last leg from British, British Guyana to uh, Cuba, uh, to uh, Puerto Rico, and then dropped the the the, the, war, war, the returning veterans of World War II in Europe to Miami. So we had the opportunity to see, have them see Miami for the first time and to learn what they were fighting for. That's amazing. What was
was it like on your families and your parents? And, and uh, they don't know that you're a twin. So talk about, you know, um, I'm the other half of this twin. Give me some of that. And then what was it like on your families when you both went off to war together? Uh, well, we were always together at all the stages. Yeah, and tell so, me who that is. You, you have a twin brother, and what's his name? Robert. Yeah. Robert and Richard. And so from that standpoint, we were always together. We teased everybody and had a great time with it. We enjoyed life. And uh, so when we got together, it was fine. But then they separated us, and we were then in war mode. So we were doing what we were told to do and th not think about yourself because we were, had something else to achieve. And that's for that reason, we never met until I was just about to go overseas and he had graduated and we met together in Austin, Texas briefly and I was sent overseas and he had to stay here. Uh, Who, who's I, older? My brother is by eight to 10 minutes. They didn't know there was two when he was born. So I was the, the culprit that was hiding. And uh, that's amazing. That shocked your family. Um, and especially then, they didn't have ultrasound, right? It just whatever came out, came out. Um, oh, geez, what was I going to say? Uh, and you just had a birthday. Yes, yesterday. Nice. How, how old are you? 96. Wow, that's amazing. And thank you for having your, celebrating some of your birthday with us here. I thank you. Museum. What do you think of this museum? How do you like it? Does it tell history right and inspire people? Uh, say that again. Uh, what do you think of this Air Force Museum? This is, you've been oh, here before. And it's a beautiful location. I haven't had a chance to see much of it I've, uh, because I've been doing other things. But it is gorgeous. It is uh, historic. It's significant. It brings back many years in many people's occupations and many people's lives just to be here and see it and then to see the people that are here trying to enjoy it and appreciate it, I think maybe respect it. That's uh, what means most to us, uh, all of us that served and uh, appreciate the fact that we were able to serve and create what we have uh, here in the, uh, in the museum. Did you see the C-47 with the D-Day markings and all that? Did you see that? I saw the C-47. Also saw the CG-4A above it, the, the glider. Pilot, the glider. Um, it brought back fond memories, although uh, the numbers aren't and the letters aren't the same, but it's the same aircraft. Sure, certainly. Yeah, and um, give me a uh, technical. How was the C-47 when it flew? I mean, was it responsive? It was a good bird to fly? It was a basically a commercial airliner that was modified to with the heavy f flooring to be able to carry cargo so we both carried cargo and uh, pa passengers uh, paratroopers it was under any condition I'd say it was an easy plane to fly a great plane to fly a very responsive uh, piece of machinery and we had no trouble with it. If we lost an engine, we weren't worried about it. Uh, we, uh, say lost, meaning stalled on us and shot or something. But it would take a great deal of assault and uh, and, pen, and enemy penetration and anti-aircraft as well as fighters and uh, all kinds of. We we and our one particular plane had to face a whole German Panzer division all by itself going flying down uh, Hell's Highway from uh, Arnhem to Nemegen. And the whole German Panzer Division could not get us out of the air. We flew so low and below and, and gone. We flew at max speed, which was 200 miles an hour and uh, knots an hour. And uh, we, we got by, okay, our crew chief and radio, op, radio operator were badly injured, particularly the crew chief. But, uh, and part of our aircraft's flying ability was shot out, but it still managed to make it to Eindhoven and land on a former German air, air base strip. Uh, that, but that was uh, um, by the grace of God and the fact that we noticed 
Then we were repairing that German airfield on our way in from Arnhem, from the Megan up to Arnhem. So I called that, I was co-pilot on the flight lead. So the, I called it to the pilot's attention and he wanted to land in a former glider drop zone. And I said, hey, I've got a daughter I have never seen yet. Let's try to make that one. He said, okay, I'll go. So we landed there without, partway shot away, but still got on the runway and got the uh, uh, crew chief and the radio operator to uh, medicals from medics from right there who were from the uh, 82nd Air Force. So you said you were a D-Day replacement, so you didn't take part in D-Day? Oh no, I was fly I was uh, riding a, a USS America over the Atlantic on D-Day uh, as a D -Day, potential D-Day replacement. A number of us were, and we were assigned to a certain squadron or group. And so from that standpoint, well, the first we knew of uh, was when we got there to England and landed on and moved, transferred up to that base, all of us that were on that ship were moved to one base or another where losses would have been expected very high as D-Day uh, um, target uh, uh, pair drop crews. Um, so what was the, was there one base that you were stationed out of then? Yeah, uh, yeah the base we were, our, our group was located at was at a little town called Laxton, which is 315th uh, Air Force Group, uh, group, group Care Group. And uh, it was a specially built uh, airfield for to accept our Troop Care Group right in the heart of England and right among the B-17s. So we would see 17s come in and out. But anyway, that's, we stayed there until almost the end of the war where we went over to Amiens, France. And from there, we were taken down to fly those planes over into uh, the Caribbean and assigned in the Caribbean Command for another three months, getting back veterans from Europe to Miami. Amazing. So that's really, that's incredible. So uh, what were some of the things you carried troops? Did you carry supplies? We carried gasoline more than anything else to Patton or wherever there were advances. We were so far across France when the time they'd use anything ground equipment, it was the same octane that the tanks needed, so they only got about half of it there. When they didn't realize that we flew a different octane and could take all the gas we hauled, uh, we were used extensively, almost on a daily basis, to wherever they get needed gas on the front lines, we would deliver it right there, and sometimes just over the front lines, uh, and. Even on occasion with Patton's army, we had a difficult time of keeping up with him. And I know one case, he ran out of gas before we got there. Wow. And he's waiting on you. <laughs> uh, very impatiently, but it was only about a half hour, I think. And the Germans hadn't realized it yet. That's incredible. So you would land on anything you could there. I mean, there Anything really was flat. We would land on and runways we never used. Occasionally, it might have been a German fighter or a base, but uh, we would land on anything that was uh, basically uh, less than a thousand feet and flat where we could fly the whole group at once. We always fly formation. So we would have maybe 60 or 40, 60 planes all on one field dropping, ga uh, dropping gas or getting rid of the gas in five gallon tanks and then trying to get back out again. Sure. So sometimes you did airdrops, but sometimes you could land. We all, no, we basically all of our time was uh, landing get fuel and supplies. However, on, in combat missions, we, would, we did not drop uh, paratroopers, I mean, carry par, paragliders. We always carried uh, the drop paratroops. And so we were, uh, right, uh, arriving with arriving with paratroopers who were ready to f to fight the Germans, and we were glad to get out safely, and then they had to fight their way out, and uh, we could drive fly out as long as we could get out of the area. 
Uh, like 101st Airborne guys. And 101st, 82nd, the British 6th, the British 1st, the Polish, uh, we dropped them all. Everything that needed to be dropped, we dropped. And uh, we, did, we towed and practiced towing, but uh, we were always targeted to fly and drop the pilots, I mean, the, the paratroopers. And uh, we relished in doing that and were probably the, one of the better or best uh, troop care groups to drop pilots, I mean, drop paragliders, I'll get ready yet, uh, paratroopers on target. It was, we're the only troop carrier group to drop uh, par, uh, par, paratroops on target on D-Day. And that was at par, uh, St. Mary Gleese. And it's, we were given special recognition award because we managed under the most unfavorable conditions to get the, plane, the troops on target. And that was your group that did that, and then you came in. That was the 101st, that was 82nd. Wow. And, but that was your, uh, the group you joined, the 315th that, that Yes. Those, and we dropped the 82nd on. on one, that time we dropped the 101st uh, on another one. We dropped the, uh, we on that same mission later, we dropped the Poles, we dropped the British uh, first. That was on, uh, on the Market Garden when we dropped the, 80s, uh, the 182nd the second time. And so uh, we were we were close contact with with them, and they respected us, and we respected what they were trying to do. When did you come home from the war? Uh, I I was uh, I had was married, of course. I had the child, and so I could not rejoin the fire department, my state fire department, where both my brother and I were uh, came from and returned. So instead, I was in had been a newspaper reporter, so I had that as a higher paid job until, and a part of my beat was to, uh, to want to get back to the troop care, uh, the fire department. So when the, pay, when the pay came up, a month later I said, sign me up, I'll leave, I'm resigning from the, fire, from the, police, from the uh, uh, newspaper, and from that time on I stayed all the way except for recall for two months, uh, for two years, in the Korean conflict. So you also served in Korea as well. Pardon me. You also served in Korea as well. Oh yes, I served the two years, but because I was fire and crash rescue officer there, and for the fire and crash rescue department, uh, I was not allowed to go into overseas because I knew too much from uh, top secret restricted. Uh, and they could not afford to have me into the hands of some enemy. So I always was kept in the United States in the Korean War and flew all over the United States in, again, the C-47 as a, as a base pilot. Okay. How many years of service then you did? Since 72. Uh, that was 35 years and retired as lieutenant colonel. Pardon me? Vietnam? Did you do Vietnam? No. That was the last time I served actively, although I remain as a fire and crash rescue officer uh, in, at Travis Air Force Base uh, on a, act, an active position, but nobody filling it at the present time. If they needed somebody, I would be re automatically recalled for that duty. And I did serve there as an active reservist, and they got to all know me. I knew them. so. It was actually just a secondary job, but uh, it was also additional income and also a part of my retirement, ultimately. Did you do anything after your retirement? Yes, I was a, uh, after, when I retired from this Cal Fire and in 79, I was a private fire investigator. I'm the one who developed the system of how you determine how a wildfire starts and where it starts. That was in 1950. Uh, that's amazing. Well, thank you for your contr contribution to that. That's very special. Uh, anything I'm missing? Anything you want to leave me with? Or words of wisdom for <sighs> troops that maybe want to get out or, you know, or somebody wanting to join? What would you say to a modern day airman? I would say establish a career and stay with it. Make sure you made the right decisions. 
uh, one that is not only fruitful, enjoyable, and somewhat profitable too, so you could live comfortably. Uh, that's what we have in the United States for, to be have a comfortable living, but you have to earn it. You don't just get it. So take the time to earn it and the edu education to get it, the skills to develop it, and follow up and work conscientiously. Don't see what you can do just to get paid. Uh, to work means that. Work and deserve it. If you do that, you'll advance to where you would like to be and qualify yourself for higher positions, better paying positions, but you have to start somewhere. You don't start at the top. That's where you end, at the top, but you start at the bottom.